Some of the most iconic species of our oceans are the killer whales. But one group of them is under a mysterious threat. The numbers of southern resident killer whales haven't increased for more than half a century, and it is a mystery that scientists are trying to uncover before it is too late. Hit like and subscribe. This is Fierce. So, what exactly is happening to them? The southern resident killer whales are considered an ecotype, a genetically distinct population. These orcas consist of around 70 individuals, and their group covers an area stretching from as far north as southern British Columbia all the way down to California. For many years, a lack of Chinook salmon has been blamed for the orca's struggles. But now, scientists think something else might be to blame. The southern residents aren't alone. There's another, larger population further north. These northern resident orcas are made up of 34 different pods, and their range overlaps with their southern counterparts. Although the geographical ranges differ somewhat, both groups spend time in the Salish Sea off Vancouver Island. It is a prime hunting ground, a place that is full of nutrient-dense salmon, and during the summer and fall, the orcas need to stock up on all the calories they can get. But for the southern resident orcas, the salmon are far more important than they are to other orcas in the area. Although the species in general hunts a variety of prey, for the southern resident killer whales, 80% of their diet is made up of Chinook salmon. This species of salmon in particular is high in fat, and an average-sized adult orca needs around 200 to 385 pounds of salmon per day to survive. Could a drop in salmon stocks be affecting the southern resident orcas? In 2024, scientists had only observed one calf being born in the southern resident pod. Although it was encouraging to see that they were breeding, it was surprising that it had been the only calf born in the entire year. Then disaster struck. At just a few months old, the calf succumbed to an unknown illness and died. It was a hammer blow for the small population of orcas and scientists didn't know what had caused the death. Infant mortality is high amongst orcas. 37 to 50 percent of all calves die during their first seven months of life. Add to that the fact that females peak in fertility at around 20 years old, have a gestation period of 15 to 18 months, and produce offspring only once every five years. Declines in populations can take many years to recover from. But fast forward to October 2024, and there was renewed hope for the southern resident orcas. Another calf was born. It was spotted swimming alongside its mother, and it was named L128 by researchers. It seemed as though things were looking up for the small population, but they were in for another shock. At just one month old, the calf appeared incredibly weak. It looked lumpy and skinny. It was clear to all those who studied the group that it was not thriving. Something was very wrong with the baby, and there was nothing anyone could do to help. In a heartbreaking moment, researchers watched as its mother carried the little calf draped over her snout. She pushed it through the water and headed for the surface. Then, another whale came up in front of the pair and jigged the little calf. It was an apparent attempt at resuscitation. Wide-eyed and open-mouthed, the researchers were certain they had just witnessed the death of yet another calf. But a moment later, they thought they saw the little calf take a faint breath before the pod disappeared from sight. Had the calf made it? Nobody could tell. But it didn't look good. The struggling population of endangered orcas has been under the careful watch of scientists and researchers for some time. As the blame was initially placed on a lack of food availability, there was a serious clash between fishermen, conservation groups, whale-watching companies, and the marine transport industry. Everyone was fighting over their own rights and the rights of the orcas themselves. Protections and restrictions were put into place to preserve the Chinook salmon. If their population crashed, then the orcas wouldn't be far behind. Having such a low calving rate in the pod was thought to be because the females weren't getting enough nutrition to carry their pregnancies to full term. They weren't in peak physical fitness to produce the offspring they so desperately needed, and if a calf was born, 
then it was born relatively weak and with little nutritious milk produced from its mother. At least that was the theory, but that wasn't necessarily the case. In fact, the idea that dwindling salmon stocks are to blame has recently been upended by researchers at the University of British Columbia. Studying both the northern and southern populations, the team found that the southern residents actually had far more Chinook salmon at their disposal than the much healthier orcas in the north. The study found that there was an abundance of salmon in the Salish Sea, a surprise result that shocked researchers. In fact, they had to check their results two or three times as they couldn't believe what they were seeing. But the data didn't lie. There is plenty of salmon in the Salish Sea for both fishermen and orcas to enjoy. So if the southern resident killer whales have plenty of food to eat, what is going wrong? Scientists are fully aware that the orcas only visit the Salish Sea for half the year. During the winter and spring months, they head to the open Pacific to hunt for food. They can travel up to 100 miles in a single day in search for prey, and they are often spotted down in Monterey Bay. Could the problem lie somewhere outside the Salish Sea? Perhaps they aren't finding the food they need when they head out into deeper water. When you look at the other marine mammals living in the Salish Sea, it seems strange that the southern resident killer whales are the only ones not thriving there. This has led scientists to think that the problem lies elsewhere, in other waters that the orcas frequent. But the inland Salish Sea has a dark history, one which many of us wish to forget. During the early 1900s, the orcas were referred to by fishermen as blackfish. They were seen as a menace as they competed for the highly sought-after salmon. The orcas were slaughtered mercilessly by fishermen due to their need to make a living. Later, the blackfish were persecuted further and captured alive for the booming aquarium industry. As traumatic as their past may have been, the killer whales weren't the only species to be pushed to the brink of local extinction. Humpback whales and fin whales suffered a similar fate. They were captured when whaling was popular and the demand for blubber and oil was soaring. It seemed many species were under threat during those dark times. But finally, when whaling was banned, populations of humpback and fin whales began to bounce back. The capture of orcas from the wild for use in the entertainment industry was also banned by Canada, but not until the 1970s, which gave hope to the Pacific orca populations. Nowadays, the Salish Sea has booming populations of harbor seals, sea lions, and porpoises. So why aren't the southern resident killer whales a part of that success? They may have access to abundant fish during their time in the Salish Sea, but what's happening when they aren't there? The suggestion that they are struggling to catch fish in the open Pacific seems a bit far-fetched. It is doubtful because the northern population is doing so well. It can't be an issue with fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean. One thing that is clear and could provide the answer lies with the amount of marine traffic the southern resident killer whales encounter. Unlike their northern cousins, those in the southern pod are exposed to many more vessels in the Salish Sea. And that's set to get worse as the Trans Mountain Oil Pipeline ramps up and a liquefied natural gas terminal is opened. Could it be that they are exposed to more pollution from heavy shipping than other populations? If the ships are having an effect, then it is more likely to be something related to the orca's social skills. Killer whales typically hunt as a pack. They are known as the wolves of the sea, relying on communication to home in on their prey and bring larger species down together. The noise from vessels is known to interfere with communication amongst cetaceans. It has been well documented and is often blamed for mass strandings of them along coastlines throughout the world. But other than disorientating marine mammals, the vibrations from ships could be inadvertently starving the southern resident killer whales. Without the ability to hunt effectively due to their communications being masked by other sounds in the water, the southern orcas could be struggling to hunt collaboratively. This would certainly explain why they are not flourishing, despite an apparent abundance of prey. The only comfort in an otherwise troubling mystery is that the southern resident killer whale population has remained static for more than 50 years. They may not be thriving and increasing their numbers, 
but they aren't rapidly declining either. Having said that, their population did consist of more than 200 individuals at the beginning of the 20th century. So perhaps it is concerning that they have never rebounded to pre-whaling and pre-capture numbers. For now, more research is needed. Scientists need to know how well the orcas are doing during the winter and spring months. They may be hunting effectively in the Salish Sea only to drop in body condition when they retreat to the open waters. If marine traffic is stopping them from hunting effectively, then will they learn to adapt to it or will human activity eventually push them to extinction? Only time will tell.